I'm accepting that. And then I'm pressing record. Check, 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 check. Record. Okay. Check, check, check. Hey now. Hey now. And then I'm you're going to do a little screen. clappy clap. Clapping in five, four, and three. There you go. Three, two, one. That's my clap. Read and all about it. Read, read all about it, y'all. Read all about it, y'all. Mike Gibbons <laughs> coming from Texas. Hell yeah, baby. That's a Texas accent, huh? How's Texas? Is it hot? I can't hear you because it's so hot. That's oh, how hot it is. Really? You ready? I'm just going to. Yeah. You ready? Here we go. It is. Uh, what's today? Friday? Yep. Friday. And it is uh, 2 p.m. in the 2 in the p.m. And I'm going to press this and local. Weather, can you read what it says? 105, baby. 105 degrees. That's Damn. all. But don't worry. It'll be 106. I will check this by the end of the podcast. And back here in Venice Beach, California, we got a smooth 79. Look at that. That's yeah. so pussified. Kind of perfect. And so it's gonna be wimpy. 79 for the next five days. Uh, it's going to be in the hundreds here. It's, uh, it's, listen, it's hot. I, I mean, I've read about this happening across the country. Have you read about in these cities, people are getting third degree burns that have to be treated because of touching doorknobs? No shit. So doorknob to this hotel room is right over there. I touched it and fucking jumped. Damn. Jumped back. Oh, it wait, was fuck. So hold hot. on, hold on, wait. I fucked up. I didn't hit record on my on my audio player. It's all right. Just press record now. Okay. Uh, do you have to clap? Why don't you clap? One, two, three. And I'll do it the same. I don't know if mine matters. Three, two, one. All right. We're not losing that gold that we just said. No, no, said. no. It was gold. We're talking about the weather. Who doesn't want to hear that? <laughs> this is the podcast for two old guys <laughs> talking about the weather for the first five minutes. Um, but anyway, the doorknob burned the hell out of me. It didn't like, you know, not bad because I'm Damn. a little quicker. I think the people getting third degree burns are maybe their hands are a little meatier and they're not as fast as I am. And then there's a little delayed sensory reaction. Like they smell it. They, they smell, smell their hand they burning. They smell bacon. They smell bacon. Cause that's what they ate every morning for the last 17 years. We had a cook in, uh, in our, I went to boarding school. So we, anyway, but I, we had a cook in the kitchen and we got to know him cause he's, you know, we ate three meals there. Anyway, he was a really funny guy and he got in a car accident, I think bad one. And he had a, he had a plate in his head, I believe. But the big problem with him in the kitchen was he could just lean on the grill and talk to you and you'd see smoke come up. I mean, that never happened. Yeah. But he had to have other chefs tell him that's hot. That's hot. Like, because he was not going to feel the hot pan or the hot no plate. No shit. Wow. Yeah. Wait, so let's cut to it. You're uh, you're in Austin, Texas. Yes. How was the mothership last night? Rogan's yeah. Club. So the, the legendary Adam Egget, who's a really good friend of ours, I met him through Norm MacDonald, and he was the manager uh, who really turned around the comedy store in L.A. Rogan set up his Mothership Comedy Club here and brought Adam down. We've talked about him before. Adam wasn't at the club last night, but I can't even tell you how set up. Like, the general manager was waiting, and I made the mistake. I go, I hope, <laughs> at one point I go, well, I hope Adam's treating you all right. And then he's like, a, he looked kind of confused, and thank God I jumped in before he did. I go, or he's like, yeah, or I'm treating Adam okay. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah. Wow. I think he might be more of a back office guy, not the hands-on guy, you know? And yeah. so anyway, the guy, I, I should know his name. It's a crime, but you know how I am with names. No offense to the guy. I mean, walked us to our seats, made sure they knew these guys, this table doesn't pay for anything. And like, and like checked in. Oh, and is a huge fan of yours. Oh, well, that's nice. That's, that's what he nice. brought up. He goes, wait a minute. He goes, you're 
because you work with uh, Greg Fitzsimmons. He's like, he was just down here not long and huge fan of yours. Oh, nice. Yeah. So, you know, the guy, he's like a big guy, big white guy. Yeah. Why looks kind of Texan. I'm fucking spacing his name. He's from Oklahoma. originally. Oh, that makes sense. Um, yeah. Well, it begins with a K or a C. Anyway. Yeah. I'm a fucking idiot. I should idiot. fucking Carl. I should know it. Uh, I'm such an idiot. Anyway, the place was great. But listen, I went to see, which is, you know, off off the uh, the usual path on the like because the other room was Ron White, the big room, you know. And oh I was yeah, yeah. Oh, you were in the smaller room. Oh, I went to the smaller room. Oh, the to smaller see, room is magic. It's to magic. see Brian Holtzman's show. Oh my god, he headlines Brian Holtzman. All right, I I might have laughed harder in a club before, but I don't remember it. Like I was dying. He does not give a shit. Yeah. And is better. Like it's more connected than he was in. Uh, and I thought, wow, being the headliner, you know, of, uh, and the show's named after him, you know, that's kind of like when I hosted the podcast with Gubbins, like, wait, this isn't my usual role. I'm not a, uh, I'm not used to this and I'm not as good at it quite honestly. And Holtzman, for all of his life was the guy they put on last because he clears the room. A lot of times people ask him for their checks and now his name is on the show and he's closing. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. He, at one point, no, I know you've seen him, but at one point he's like, <laughs> he, of course, like Brody, he screams at the audience and gets yeah. angry and he said something. He's like, Oh, oh, oh the, he's like, little feelings. And he's screaming at these people. He's like, um, there have to, he goes, there have to be victims in my jokes. I punch down. <laughs> <laughs> and I, hilarious. I almost fell off my seat. Oh so anyway, uh, I'm going back there, uh, just to see Adam tonight. So probably like grab a drink in the bar or something like that. Uh, I'm not going to a show there, but, uh, I'll stop by cause he's, the, he's working tonight. He's the greatest. I just talked to him last week. He's he's the best. Yeah. Um, and so what would you think of the actual structure? What did you think of the, the room? It was a little disorienting. So when I went in, I was expecting like more of a lobby, almost yeah. like when you go in the Pantages, like here's your lobby before you go into the showroom, you know, with, with bars and merch. Yeah. And it was kind of, you know, they I, I think they did have merch, but it was kind of a all right, here's your choice. Two staircases. One goes to that room. One goes to the other, you know, like that. I didn't see the lounge, which is a separate That's door. downstairs. Yes. So I didn't see that. Uh, so I saw that on the way out. And of course the guy whose name we have to look up by the end of this podcast, uh, he caught me leaving in the lobby and we were then going to go next door. And he walked us in and said to the bar, like, make sure these guys don't pay. Like again, right. Right. Such, such great treatment. Yeah, no, they everybody everybody there is, you know, he, there was about four or five people that came from the comedy store over there and then they hired a bunch of amazing local people. There's a ton of security, but make sure Adam takes you to this lounge because it's like a VIP, it's a speakeasy. They designed it to be a speakeasy. It's got like booths set into the wall kind of privately and then it's a tight little bar and they only allow the comedians in and then sort of like, oh. you know, friends of the club. And uh, it, it's really you want you're going to hang out there all night. Last time I was there, I was there till five o'clock in the morning with Shane Gillis, Ari Shafir and, and uh, Mark Normand. Is it, always, those guys are always it, stopping in town. It's not the one to the left of the lobby. It's underground. It's underground. It's downstairs. Oh, yeah. OK. I'll make sure. Um, but, yeah. But, but yeah, have a, and where are you staying? Are you in a hotel right there? Yeah, I'm in a hotel. Uh, uh, I don't even know the areas of Austin, but we're across the river, which way too often they call a lake. We're across the river um, from downtown in this very hot area. Hotel Magdalena is where I am. Yeah. Um, and it was one of those Amex offers, and I, I, I just take it for everything it's worth. Like uh, a lot. Anyway, it worked out really cheap. But still, the pool. I think they have to cool the pool. I'm imagining, because I don't know how the pool isn't like practically boiling at this point. So anyway, um, 
But you brought up Shane Gillis. I watched his new special on Netflix, his only special, his first special ever, kind of. It Who's? was Shane. Oh, yeah. It was really solid. Shane's about to blow up. He's about to become one of those guys that goes from playing, you know, a thousand seats to playing ten thousand seats in this next year. That yeah. he is so fucking strong and that special is so good. And he's like he's a he's got that magical combination of being uh brave on stage. I hate the word brave. I would say and I hate the word edgy. I would just say he's very uh raw he's a lot like louis ck he gives you a premise that is unsupportable yes. that is wrong and then he backs you into it and he does it with this little twinkle in his eye and with just great writing and fucking total commitment that he's he's really he's great so you saw the special yes yeah where he calls navy seals pussies <laughs> Like at cowards, actually, he goes. They're sort of cowards. The more you think about it, <laughs> and then how he roots for Al Qaeda. Right. And by the way, I'm not spoiling any of this because then that's the little premise he floats, and you're like, "What are you going to do with this?" And then you see what he does with it. Yeah. Right. 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 Um. He also, like Holtzman, <laughs> uh, still employs the word retarded a lot, and. Holtzman has no excuse, but Shane has this ingenious thing because he has Down syndrome in his family, and he talks yeah, about his, his uncle. Yeah, well, his niece has it as well. Oh, I didn't know that. And yeah. so he goes full-on impression of his uncle, no. and you're like, wow, I haven't seen this on stage in a long while. Oh, God. Yeah, but it's I don't hysterical. Like that. I don't like that. No, it's incredibly positive. It's his uncle. He just talks about his uncle as like the happiest person. But he yeah. also, whatever, there's a grilled cheese part, which is really funny. I think I missed that. I think I missed that. I didn't watch the whole thing. Oh, no, no. Gotta... You might have seen a special that he did like kind of during the pandemic. Yeah. And it was, it might have been in, it was in the South somewhere. And it, and it was very lo-fi. This is his Netflix special. Giant. Where did, where did he shoot it again? Uh, Virginia, I think. Oh, that's weird. It, no, it dropped this week. Huh. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right, listen. Uh, let's get to our song this week, which was, I think, oh, wait. First, I want to talk about on my podcast this week, I want to encourage people to tune in. I had on one of my favorites of all time, Eddie Izzard, who is now Susie Izzard, although I didn't dead name her because – she doesn't mind if you call her either one, which is nice. There's no pressure with Susie Izzard to say, I don't even think she minds you saying he. Uh, she's very open to it. And here's the thing about Susie Izzard. She puts out two-hour specials where she, she then does 15-minute encores where it's killer the whole way through. Oh, she's, she's one of the top female comedians. Yes. <laughs> yes, she is. Um, and then uh, that's funny. And then she. I uh, don't think it's original. That she has ran to be 29, 29 marathons in 29 days. And oh. she did the equivalent of that about three times. That is a woman. She's full blown crazy. That's right. <laughs> what and the I, fuck is that? And I forgot to ask, and I really, I wrote down this question. I forgot to ask it, and I'm kicking myself, is how much of you is running towards something and how much of you is running away from something? Because I think that's a good a, question when you're that fucking crazy. I don't know if it's very gentlemanly to put a lady on the spot like that, but that's all right. That's true. Yeah. And uh, she also is running for uh, parliament Wow. in England. And she speaks, she does stand up comedy in five different languages. She's impressive. And gal. is severely dyslexic. So learns the languages by going to that country and just being surrounded by it. She can't read it. Susie's an interesting choice for a last name is Ard. It's almost like Suzard. Susie is Ard. Susie is Ard. Yeah, I think it's got a nice little buzzing. There's a little buzzing There's sensation. There's a lot of buzz just in the name alone. 
But that was really fun. Unfortunately, it was over Zoom, so uh, you know, it didn't have that in-person thing. But it still, she she was very very generous. We we had a good time. Um, nice. So the song this week, which was great, was uh, Mike Sapienza and his buddy Tony Cryer did it uh, together. Very cool. Was it Blink? I think Blink cool. One Eighty Two. It's a it's that nineties fun vibe. I, I think yeah. it's Blink One Eighty Two. Yeah, kind of a clean pop rock vibe. And then the uh, logo this week was Lyndon Pike, and the reason it is uh, it's it's obviously Bernie Topper and uh, Elton John, and we'll get into why later when we hit the entertainment section but it's very um very relevant right now yeah and of course they made me bernie taupin this is ridiculous of course, thank you of course thank you yeah maybe that's because i didn't really write last week and i just mailed it in <laughs> is that why i'm guessing that's why either that or i was chin deep in some balls last week but whatever i don't think i talked about that on the show you are always the lady uh corrections on last week's episode of sunday papers you mentioned the thing about jews having sex through a sheet with a hole in it hmm. i learned a little about the topic from everybody's favorite jew ari shafir he covers the topic in his special jew <laughs> and uh apparently the sheet with a hole was all just a rumor that never held much water so Wow, really? Yeah. That I seems mean, we, like a very creative lie. Like, why? That's going pretty far down the creative path. Like, it also isn't, I guess it makes them look crazy. Yeah, it does. That's what all the jokes are about. But it's. it seems, I mean, they, they do far. The Orthodox uh, have far more, I want to be gentle here, but like confounding and puzzling to outsiders traditions and customs than that. It's weird. That one was made well, up during the bris. The, the rabbi will suck the infant's penis after the cutting of the foreskin. Is this a, f I'm hoping this is a Fitz fact. This is, no, this is a fact. This is a real thing. I don't oh. think in all sex, but in, I think ultra Orthodox, they, they do it. And priests are like, hold my beer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm starting. I'm starting to fade a little bit on this Jesus guy. I don't, well, think, he was, like, I don't uh, think he was that big of a deal. They're like, is is twelve and thirteen too late to uh, do that religious practice? <laughs> <laughs> um, that was from Ben Holdridge, and then there was Mike. Who, Mike says nobody wants to go up against a Spartan army, but history shows they won half their battles at best. Is and that then he true? sent me a link to an article. I get a lot of people sending me mail with links to articles. I'd read that article. I'll send it to you, but uh, it's just I got a full disclosure. I don't always read every article because I go through about uh, 50 emails a day from people, and I don't have time to read all the links. I wonder what the context is because um – they're a tiny island, and the you know the Holy Roman Empire was probably some of those battles. Right? I know I know famously in the movie they show the Persians taking them on in the in the movie Three Hundred, and of was course that in Glendale. Uh, I think they lost that one, but that <laughs> that whole movie is about the remarkable how few there were and how long they held them off, I guess, before they were defeated. Huh. Okay. Did you ever see the movie 300? Oh, yeah, it was great. It's in, it's just pure adrenaline. It's, it's Some fantastic. of the CGI is a little wonky, but, uh, but oh, I love the movie. They shot it in like a movie hangar in Toronto or something yeah. insane, all green right. screen, but I still, I still liked it. Um, do you know that Top Gun was shot without any CGI? All that stuff with the jets being inches from each other and all that stuff was was actually real. All right. Uh, speaking of real, I am really coming to Irvine, California on September 10th to play the improv. Yeah, you Escondido, are. Escondido, Grand Comedy Club, September 22nd, 23rd. Shirley, Mass., Manchester, New Hampshire, Nashua, New Hampshire, Foxborough, Mass., Sacramento, Arlington, Virginia, 
Baltimore, Houston, Bakersfield, San Francisco, Fort Worth. And we actually have some new dates I'll be announcing next week. Go to FitzDog.com. Come support live comedy before the comedy boom ends. Also, let's talk about if you want to go out and see comedy, you want to see theater, you want to see rock music, you want to see sports. But, hey, do you want to stress out about it? Do you want to think about, oh, am I buying the tickets too early? Is no. Are they going to drop later? Yes, they're going to drop later. That's why you got game time, bitch. Yep, here it is, game time in Austin. Drake is playing here on the 12th, 314 bucks. We're going to watch that one go down. Uh, what else do we have this weekend? Oh, Moto America Superbikes. Whoa, is that popular here? 98 bucks. Damn. You could, you could go to, I mean, that's like 50 or 45 WNBA games for that money. That's right. Do you want to see Ashniko? Look at Ashniko. Who's that? I don't know. It looks like this female. It's a female. I think it's a female performer. Very colorful. Blue hair. Uh -huh. Very red eye. Anyway, 23 bucks. All right, well, listen, there's killer deals on last-minute tickets. The app is so easy to use. It's a couple of taps. There's no printing. There's no uh, messaging, to emailing it to yourself or any of that stuff. It's just right there, and uh, I've used it many times. Mike's used it many times. We've had so many listeners oh, it's great. write in and say, we love this app. We love game time. So check out your seats. So they got views uh, on the app. You can look at what your seats look like. They got a guarantee. If you find the same tickets in the same row, they'll give you 110% of the difference. Yep. And, uh, and, and dig it. Snag the tickets without the stress with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code PAPERS for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code PAPERS for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets. Down lowest price guaranteed. All righty. And now on to a new sponsor, Prize Picks. It's the largest independently owned daily fantasy sports platform in North America. Easiest, most exciting way to play DFS. It's just you against the numbers instead of battling like thousands of other players, which includes, of course, pros and sharks. You pick more than or less than on your two to six player stat projections and watch the winnings roll in. So prize picks is the most fun. Uh, you win up to 25 times your money this season. You just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projected stats and place your entry. No, it's 25. So literally this week I bet $10 and I got the 25 boost. I won $250 on a $10 bet. When I took golf to throw less than uh, the less than I took the more than and it was mm. uh, it was it, he had one interception and it was at point five. Right. And then, what did you what did you pick? Didn't you I did. It? That's why I yelled out less than I did the less than on Mahomes. It was the the number was two point five touchdown passes and he did two. So I chose the less and rolled in the dough. Nice. Yes, it's great. So um, go to prizepicks.com slash papers and use code papers for a first deposit match up to $100. Um, Daily Fantasy Sports Made Easy. That's their tagline. Daily Fantasy Sports Made Easy. And we need it easy. Obviously, you've heard us talk about sports things before and sports in general. And we need that made easy for us. And that's what this was. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Try it out. And also, you can um, uh, you can use Apple Pay. Uh, it's the, the whole I used Apple Pay. It made it so much easier. Yeah, and there's uh, weekly promotions. It's great. Check it out. All right, let's get to... Extra, extra, we all about it. Extra. Get old paper going. Front page, baby. Oh, here it comes. Well, this one, uh, it came out Thursday, which was yesterday, and kind of rocked the comedy world a little bit, or the entertainment world. Uh, the name of the uh, the Rolling Stone article was Chaos, Comedy, and Crying Rooms inside Jimmy Fallon's Tonight Show. 
Um, 16 anonymous current and former staff members accused the late night show of having a toxic work culture. Sound familiar? Allegedly, it starts at the top. Staffers on the show are used to there being either good Jimmy days or bad Jimmy days in which Fallon is prone to outbursts and erratic behavior. It was like if Jimmy is in a bad mood, everyone's day is fucked, said one of them. Some staffers attribute his behavior to Fallon's alleged overuse of alcohol. Some say they think he was drunk at work, and eight former employees said the quality of the workday depended on whether Fallon was hungover, which is something you and I have heard for years. Uh, I can't comment on that, but I will say <laughs> he seems to get injured a lot. There's constantly a broken <laughs> arm showing up. Uh, and I, I got to find out what Andy Kindler is saying about this because he has had it in for Fallon. I remember one of his tweets was, uh, Jimmy Fallon is the Jimmy Fallon of Jimmy Fallon's. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> There's just something about a guy that's that happy. And look, full disclosure, I really like Jimmy. He used to open for me when, when he was on his way up. I used to bring him on the road with me and he'd open for me. And he's been very, very kind to me over the years. He's a really sweet dude. So whatever it is that's happening, I attribute it to the pressure of doing a daily show, which you and I both have done in the past. And I have never imagined being the person whose face is on the show, whose name is on the show, who's doing a monologue, who's prepping for interviews, who's yeah. playing games, who's then finishing the show to do promotion with Atlanta and tape a fucking happy birthday message for the president of the network. And then, you know, it's a lot, it's a lot right. of pressure. And I don't think it brings out the best in people. I agree. And uh, I also, like I do, even with Ellen and other places, I do look at some of the comments because listen, you and I have been, kind of journeyman in this in this arena and i've been in a bazillion writers rooms and you do have to have a little bit like of a thicker skin also oh and a kind of an emotionally abusive host yeah welcome to showbiz is yeah. there's part of it is you are dealing with someone who's under that crazy pressure yeah um, I, I heard a story and i can't tell you who told me but it was the guy it happened to um, was a producer on Johnny Carson forever. And one time at like one of the Christmas parties or wherever it was. And Johnny famously, which he's owned, was a bad drunk and a bad drinker and would get violent. And I think it's on record. He even got violent uh, with and physical with uh, at least one of his wives, too, along the way. So anyway, he pinned this guy up by his neck in the hallway and says, you guys do fucking nothing. It's all on my back and said exactly what you were saying at the beginning, like verbalized that pressure. I'm yeah. not defending this and saying it's right, but you kind of know this going in or you should know it by your second tour of duty. And a lot of these people aren't new. So anyway, here were some of the comments, which I, I thought were also funny. Um, they said that he, they, he would write notes and feedback <laughs> And they could be passive aggressive. This was like on their monologue jokes and stuff. Uh, they would they say he would write comments like, are you OK? Seriously, do you need help? <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. I, I like think that. that's I think that's amazing. Yes. First of all, if that came back to me, I mean, yes, he's trying to insult me, I guess. But it's hysterical. Yeah. Um, and then he would also, one writer said, he, he came back and it said, ugh, lame. What is going on with you? You've outdone yourself. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Writers are fucking lazy. I've been a writer for 20 years. And if you don't give me some shit and you don't push me a little bit, yeah. I'm not going to give 100%. It's part of your fucking job. We, were, we both worked for Ellen. I was there for the first two years. And there's no way Fallon was any worse than Ellen. I, not even close. No way. And did I leave? No. I got fired like a man, <laughs> just like you. All right, wait, I got to see. I took f uh, screen grabs of some of the articles. Um, it was the first time I'd say, oh, okay. So here was another one. This is the last thing I'll say. 
all of a sudden it came out that in like, I forget where it was, but he did, I think it was on SNL oh, a long, like in the nineties or he did an impression of Chris Rock, Jimmy Fallon did, and he got in blackface. Right. And he then when it surfaced, I think maybe probably during Black Lives Matter, he had to issue an apology, of course. And he goes, there's no excuse for this. I think there's an excuse for it. You're doing an impression of your friend. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah. I am very sorry for making this unquestionably offensive decision and thank all of you for holding me accountable. Um, while Phelan publicly addressed the video, employees say there was an internal uproar because staff members weren't happy the talk show host didn't directly directly acknowledge the incident with them. Yeah. Uh, go fuck yourselves. <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> and I'm not talking about the issue of if, if, he, if he put on blackface or not. That has nothing to do with it. He issued a public apology. Yeah. Like, you need him to come and give you a personal one? Now, apologies, that's the reason why some people say never apologize, because even when you do, like Louis C.K. apologized, it's never enough. It's never right for every group, and they're going to make the noise, and then the press is going to pick up on that noise, and it's going to make your apology worse than how things were when you started. I know, and it's like, and and also some of them were like, uh, we didn't know about this. It's like, well, who's that on? Yeah. It was on fucking Saturday Night Live, I think. Like, it, what, They yeah. didn't hide it. Yeah, right. That is bizarre that they put that on Saturday Night Live. I mean, it, it just goes to show you how fast things change and what short memories we have about context. And what would, I mean, look, blackface, I have no idea why they let that on the air. That is crazy. But the fact that they did it and now the idea of doing it, like, you can't, we'll probably get in trouble right now for what we're saying, never mind actually doing it. And, uh, you know, words you can say that, like, you couldn't before, like you said about Shane Gillis, like, that has been eradicated. That word and oh, yeah. acting that out has been eradicated. And uh, it's, it's you know, people don't remember that it didn't used to be like that. So fucking video, it's too bad there's video around. Uh, yeah, but as you said, there is different context and, you know, he apologized for it. And, um, but, but anyway, back to the staff members who need, who are like, a, don't, you know, there was that great line in tar, the movie, don't be so eager to be offended. Yeah. You, you are truly eager to be offended. If you are offended that the host who issued an apology didn't come to you who right. were probably born the year this shit went on right. and apologized to your face. Yeah. You, that's eagerness. That's eagerness to be offended. Yeah. And by the way, if you are even easy to be offended or slightly eager to be offended, do not get in a comedy writer's room. How about that? Yeah, everybody wants to do comedy because, you know, they went, they went to a fucking college and they graduated without really knowing what they wanted to do. And then comedy seemed like a good path because you can make a lot of money. And people have said, I'm funny, but you're not dark. You're not broken. Comedy is for dark, <laughs> broken people who are who can stand a little fucking ass kicking and, and they can get in there and be a dysfunctional child and put up with shit like that. And yeah. And I mean, uh, the whole genre of satire, it, it, it can be incredibly dark and brutal. You're yeah. going to make, you know, back to even Swift, like about eating children in Ireland. Like, you know, you're going to, and that is back then. Like you're yeah. going to, your job is to find where the line is many times. That's one of the jobs for sure. Yeah, the only way to find the line is to go over it a little bit in the writer's room and then get pulled back. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's a place to, you know, be tolerant yeah. of things that you wouldn't necessarily accept once they went on the air anyway let's move on before we get more canceled than we already are um towing <laughs> well, company. No, well wrong story then <laughs> oh, towing right. company towing company offers bizarre explanation for hauling suv with two children inside a 26 year old woman called police just after 11 a.m tuesday to report her suv 
and two children ages three and one were stolen from the fashion center in Arlington. Police quickly realized the car had been towed from a no parking zone and that a preliminary investigation indicates the tow operator was unaware the children were inside. And upon notification, he pulled over to check on them and they were fine. The tow company, here we go. The tow company blamed the mistake on the sun's glare in the windows and because the seats were black leather and the children were African American. Uh, <laughs> why say it? Why say it? You know, d- just don't say it. Just say uh, there was a lot of glare. That's you it. You had it. You had yeah. it at glare. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> I heard that last week he towed a Guatemalan family sitting in a car with leather seats, you know, and that's, that's why. Are you, are you saying it was brown leather, Greg? Yes. It was like a (laughs) deep brown leather. If I was that driver, (laughs) let me tell you something. And I issued that statement. As soon as it came out of my mouth, I'd hopefully realize what I just said. And I would immediately search desperately for any car with white leather and a white person in it and tow it immediately. <laughs> Even if the white bitch is behind the wheel, how could you not see her with the giant hat and her pink glasses? Right. Because she's white, like the seats. This right. happens all the time. I'm colorblind. I'm a colorblind <laughs> tow truck driver. She's camouflaging herself. What, what do I have to, I can't tow geckos? What's happening here? And also like the three-year-old, I get the one-year-old. He, he's strapped into a baby seat. He, he knows three words. The three-year-old, well, how fucking quiet is this kid? You know, I, I, I'm sure the mother didn't seal the windows. The windows are open. What did he think? What do you think? Mommy was pulling a wheelie with a remote control? Yeah. Also, yeah. Are they wearing outfits that look like strewn French fries all over the back seat? That's how they'd really blend in. Let's be honest. Or yeah. Cheerios. Cheerios right. are everywhere in a back seat like that. Yeah, right. Um, the mother left her white. It turns out the mother left her white Hyundai Kona with the engine running and the doors unlocked for 16 minutes in a fire lane outside the mall. She was cited for contributing to the delinquency of a minor. But I, it sounds like she wanted the kids taken, but not by the authorities. Right, right. Yes. I mean, what, what is up with that? That is, uh, I mean, look, sometimes they got a sale at the mall. It was Labor Day weekend. And maybe uh, you got to You got to grab that fucking uh, the, that pair of Uggs when you can. Sweaters half off children free. <laughs> w- w- I mean, it's known. What a weekend. It's known for oh its sales. My God. It's fantastic. All right. You could stay in the car. Stay extremely still and quiet. <laughs> yeah. Uh, here's a. Uh, Family of a Massachusetts 14-year-old who died suddenly believes oh. an extremely spicy corn chip that he ate for a TikTok challenge may be responsible for his death. Uh, Harris Wulaba died on September 1st after his mother picked him up from school due to complaints of a stomachache. The sophomore had just taken part in the one chip challenge, which involves eating a single corn chip laced with Carolina Mm. Reaper and scorpion peppers, two of the world's hottest peppers. The snack is made by Austin, Texas based Pacqui. Right here. Specializes corn chips. A classmate provided him with the chip. I mean, this is like, this is like the fentanyl of snack foods. (laughs) There should be hotlines, like fentanyl hotlines, like yes. stay on the phone while I eat this chip, please. <laughs> you might have to call the authority. Here's my address. Right. Totally. Oh you know, I God. thought when I read this article that uh, that one chip was the Carolina Raper. And I know they're getting really creative naming hot things. You know, there's like devil's bitch hot sauce, yeah, yeah. anal angst hot sauce, <laughs> ass in the tub hot sauce. These are all real. Really? But I thought... I thought Carolina Raper seemed too hot, if you ask me. Just well, a little too hot. Not as hot as Caroline Ray. What if there was a <laughs> Caroline Ray chip? That'll I'll tear the ass mouth. out of you, too. Yeah. <laughs> how bad, by the way, how yeah. bad does his broke ass best friend want to load this fucking thing on TikTok <laughs> and just watch the revenue stream in? 
He didn't Who? die while doing it, so that's what the friend's thinking. I mean, what happened in the old days when 14-year-olds just did circle jerks and huffed paint cans? <laughs> well, I will tell you, at Tosh, we you know obviously would search day and night at Tosh.0 for, for these things. And at the time, a very popular one, we're talking about 2009, was the Cinnamon Challenge. And then we'd have people do it. We had that Miss South Carolina who did the um, like, um, like world piece. We had uh, her yeah. do it. We had her do it. And then lawyers. Was she as dumb as she seemed on that video? Um, she, she was so nice. And, of course, on those, we normally, like, you know, take their side. And she was in on it. And I, I just have so much respect for someone who's willing to make fun of themselves. Yeah. So we did we did the web redemption with her. But, and also she was game to do anything. So we're like, hey, do you want to do the cinnamon challenge? So anyway, but lawyers then descended on us. So kids die from the cinnamon challenge. Is that, what do you snort cinnamon? No, you take a, at least a tablespoon and you just try to eat it. Oh. And there's a technique like it's called chunking where you're actually some people are able to do it. But generally uh, it asphyxiates you. The powder causes massive coughing and it's really hard to breathe. Damn. Yeah, it's bad. You could you could Google it and you'll find it's it's similar to this thing. Like it's da it's more dangerous than it sounds. And I hate to be that guy, but it is uh, All right, a, a related story. Look what you put as the next story. The next story is about, and this is one uh, people are dying to hear us talk about, uh, a Delta passenger sprayed oh. diarrhea everywhere aboard a midair flight, forcing the plane to turn around and go back to the airport. Uh, they, they, the flight was headed to Barcelona after taking off from Georgia. While over Virginia, the passenger's gastrointestinal issues exploded into the open, giving everyone on board a front row seat to the disgusting aftermath. I mean, I, I, I got a lot. I got a lot to address here. Okay. The flight captain radioed air traffic control to report the incident and said he seemed pretty calm under the circumstances. On the recording, he says, it's just a biohazard issue. <laughs> we have a passenger who had diarrhea all the way through the airplane, so they want us to come back to Atlanta. People complained on social media. Quote, my partner was on that flight. It was pretty bad. It was dribbled down the aisle, smelled oh, no. horrible. Oh, no. Another said the vanilla scented disinfectant used on it only made it smell like vanilla shit. <laughs> yeah. That's, no its, word, that's its job. No word yet on the condition of the passenger. That's my favorite line in the whole article. Because that's what everybody's worried about. Well, we it's, also got too many words on his condition. I think his condition is deep embarrassment. You know, Delta's first class, it's called Delta One. I, I think it's Delta Two now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, at least, like, at least, you know, running up the aisle spraying diarrhea, at least the asshole isn't exactly at face level while the guy is doing that. Do you remember that story years ago where the guy drunk? In first class, got up on the cart and took a shit. That oh, was like my right. favorite story yeah, of that year. That was probably the be best story of the year. This guy Just, outdid him though. Yeah, I, and you know, here's the thing about pants. I mean, where <laughs> where were the pants? Pants serve a lot of functions. I, I love pants. They they hide your genitals. They keep your legs warm. They give you little pockets you can store things in. But here's the main thing they do. They prevent explosive diarrhea from spraying fellow passengers on a transatlantic flight. What? And I'm reading back through the article a little. Why is he moving around so much? I don't know. I don't know why his pants are down, and I don't know why he's running up the aisle. I don't know why there's not video. Did nobody videotape this and put it up? You don't run or run up and down the aisle masturbating. You have the decency to lock yourself in the lock bathroom the door, and do that. put my forehead against the wall, <laughs> line the line the seat with toilet paper. What is this guy's issue? Yeah. It's At this really... point the, the the pilot's probably like, if you if you got him if you got him, smoke him. You know what? Just light up <laughs> anything. Everyone smoke. Pass your cigarettes free. around. Free light as many matches as you can. Yep. Oh, open man. your windows. Disgusting. That's the thing about a plane. There's no windows to open. Oh, no. my God. I would have my mouth 
on that fucking little air blower above my head. I would close my nose and just breathe through that. They should drop all the oxygen masks and yes. everyone, and you don't have to tell any, everyone to put theirs on first before children right, right on my face first. Right. Cause Absolutely. not only is it giving you air to breathe, it's keeping the shit from going on your face. I part meanwhile, Barcelona must've been like, no, thank you. Yeah. No one is disembarking that plane. Yeah. All right. Wow. Oh. Um, all right, let's get to the entertainment section. Crumple, crumple. All right, and this is a thing. Again, we teased it at the beginning of the show. Bernie Taupin has a new book <laughs> about his life and about his creative process, <sighs> and he's getting a lot of attention for it. Mark Marin. I hope he didn't write it. Mark Marin had him on the podcast this <clears throat> week. And right. people are dying to know if you've listened to the Mark Marin interview with Bernie Taupin. I have not. I I am hoping there's piano accompaniment to everything he says, and that Sir Elton John has provided that. But I will. I, I I'm just. Oh no, hearing... there is piano accompaniment. He wrote he wrote a theme song for Mark Marin. Oh, I am sure it's gold. All right, what is that? It's. Smooth talking man in the frying pan got a nickel to talk up frozen. Hold on, ham. hold on. Is this a joke? No, these are really the lyrics he wrote for Mark Marin. You didn't song. write this to please me to make fun of him. No. Smooth no. talking man in the frying pan got a nickel to talk up frozen ham, but I think he's going to meet up with a president who doesn't make no sense and is not a gent. So riff on, my scruffy matador. You can't find the door, and now you're on your own. In the podcast zone. Oh, Mark, it's so cold out there. What? No, I wrote it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I wrote it in like 25 seconds. No, that's as if you told AI, write the shittiest Elton John lyrics ever. Oh, God. Yeah, I think I spent as much time writing that as he wrote Rocket Man. Uh, yeah, probably. But, but there, he really did write one. No. Oh, oh, I, I think he should have. I when did you, when did you lose the fact that this is a comedy podcast and I'm a comedian? No, but I thought if he's on there, Marin, he, he'd come up like with a gift, like, Hey, by the way, I wrote some lyrics for a the, I know you don't have uh your theme yeah. song. You, you know, you've used the same one forever, but blah, blah, blah. Yeah. That's very believable to me. Well, I sold it. It was a good sell. And uh, oh, by the way, I just want to mention, I went to the comedy store last night. Erin's friend is uh, very wealthy and her husband had like this five hundred dollar sweater that they they give me his clothes sometimes if he doesn't like like she'll buy him something. If he doesn't like it, they give it to me. And it was like the corniest. It was like the kind of sweater. It was a cardigan V-neck with big buttons that had pockets on the front. It was like something that you'd smoke a pipe. And, yeah. and be a douchebag. And so I wore it to the comedy store on purpose because I wanted to just give a gift to the comedians. And I even texted Ian Edwards on the way over. I go, are you at the store tonight? And he's like, yeah. And I go, good. And then I walked in and I just, he was standing there with like five other comics. And I just walked up and I smiled and I stood in front of him. And he looked at me like he was inspecting sushi. And what, what, what great sushi he was going to buy for the store. And then he just goes, uh, he goes, shouldn't you be going door to door telling people you're a sex offender? <laughs> and then five guys jumped in and they fucking roasted me for like 15 minutes. <laughs> it's also shocking you weren't in maroon, I guess. Yes. No, it was gray. Very brave of you. Very brave of you to do that. Yeah. Did you get up know. on stage with it? I did, and then it made me. It did. I didn't realize how much I need to be wearing my own clothes on stage because I bombed. I didn't bomb. I tried all new stuff, and it didn't go well. Um, but uh, yeah, I felt weird on stage. The guy in the weird sweater bombed. You didn't bomb, right? Uh, Al um, Pacino and Nor Alfala. Pacino uh, is eighty three. Alfala is twenty nine. Huh. And they just had a baby three months ago. So, in other words, he is exactly the age difference if I were to marry somebody who was born last week. That would be <laughs> the age difference that he is to her. That's great. Yes. That you did and, that math. 
and she has now filed for full custody uh, to pave the way for child support. Wow. So it didn't work out. I wonder what it was. I mean, it's like, and we have a friend who did this, it's like when you get charmed by somebody from an Eastern European country and you marry them, or from an Asian country, and then they get the marriage, they, they get the ring on their finger, and they fucking leave you six months later, and they got a green card, and they got half your money. And and this chick, she had him in the crosshairs for how long? Well, you know, you don't get a you know a short term marriage. You don't get like half and all that. There's probably a buyout. But what she's doing, that's what they said, is she's filing for full custody because then she will get a very healthy child support for 18 years. Yeah, right. Yeah. And at 18, when the kid's 18, she will only be 48. This woman. <laughs> right. And he half will be dead. Pacino's age now almost. He will obviously be yet be dead because that would make him a hundred years old. So, the baby would probably inherit. I don't know how many other kids he has, but I mean, Pacino's got to be worth what thirty million. Yeah, I wonder how they do that. If you kind of know, death is imminent, you know, statistically, but also you do it if they. I know, like in my divorce contract, one hundred twenty million. He's worth. Oh, I think. Wow. Okay. Um, I, uh, in my divorce contract and in everybody's, I th- well, a lot of people's, uh, it, there can be the life insurance clause. You have to have a life insurance filled out in the children's and your ex's name. And my, my ex actually has a life insurance policy because she had one during the marriage and I'm the beneficiary of that and the kids. So I wonder what it is in terms of his 120 million. If he dies next year, like, where does her child support come from? Right. There has to be a trust and all that shit, I guess. Oh, wow. What an age difference, man. So Pacino has a uh, a daughter who is uh, 34. So she has a younger sister who is 34 years younger than <clears throat> her. Got it. Which wow. isn't even that big of a spread, considering he, he could have a daughter who's 60. You know. Oh, he could have a daughter older than 60. If he had yeah. someone at 20 years old, she's 63. Wow. Yeah. Um, all right. Why are you going to break up with me now? What the fuck is wrong with you? Now fly, you fly pelican. Say hello to my, what was it? Who are you saying hello to again? <laughs> I, I saw I, him uh, walking down the street with her. It was fucking embarrassing. I mean, that dude, he's not a young 83. He's like shuffling around, and he looks yeah. incoherent. Yeah, that 80 is a magic number, man, uh, yep. for, for people you know, born back then. I don't know what it'll be like in 40 years, but yeah, like I, when I saw Dylan, I couldn't believe how how old he seems now, you know? Yeah. Like real, yeah. real shuffling going on, you know? Yeah. Um, all right, everyone go home. Oh, speaking, this this falls right into it. Everyone go, go home. The boss called in sick. Bruce Springsteen announced on his website Wednesday that he was postponing shows for the remainder of the month while he is treated for symptoms of, quote, peptic ulcer disease. Another headline could have been, 74-year-old just can't anymore because of heartburn. <laughs> <laughs> the postponed shows, including scheduled stops in Baltimore, Philadelphia, Albany, and Syracuse, Pittsburgh, Wash and Washington, and shows in Connecticut and Ohio. The boss first felt the stomach issues on a Delta flight from Georgia to Barcelona, where he shit all <laughs> over the aisle. <laughs> oh, my stomach's on fire! <laughs> I think the, the 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 ulcer might be uh, that he knew he was going to Pittsburgh and Philly. It's just coincidence that it happened the week before. Yeah, I'd I'd have tremendous heartburn and shitting myself if that were if that were the thing. You know, it's too bad because now we won't be able to play his songs. No retreat, no surrender. Tougher than the rest. Walk like a man. The rising. <laughs> the rising. <laughs> he also had a pretty bad incident on Fifty Seventh Street. <laughs> <laughs> 
the boss. Yeah, uh, again, he has to cancel it because of heartburn. It's again, it's more like the secretary, not the boss. That, yeah. Those are the vibes I'm getting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The uh, the interim secretary, uh, Danny Masterson. Should we talk about that? Yeah, let's lighten it up with some rape. Danny, how about no? Let me let me rephrase that. Let's lighten it up with some justice. Danny Masterson was sentenced to 30 years to life in prison for multiple rapes. In his defense, I would say, dude, it was the 70s. It was a different time. I don't think we should judge him this harshly. Um, as the one, uh, as the one time that 70s show actor, that's an awkward phrase, was for both of his trials on the criminal. As the one time was for both of them. Oh, Masterson was present, sorry, in both the trials. He was in court for the sentencing. He was permitted to address the court, but Masterson chose not to speak. That's because there's a writer's strike. He has no idea what to say unless someone's writing it for him. Um, yeah, but anyway, good, he is going and away. And that's a sought-after punch-up job, is the appealing a rape on the stand. Yeah. 30 years. Wow. By the way, there's no fucking way his agent didn't know this stuff was going down again and again. I think the agent should have to do 10% of the sentence <laughs> with Danny Masterson. Three years in prison? Yeah. Or a third or a third of life? Because it's three years to a third of life. That's what his sentence would be. Right, or right. hers. And you know he's going to try to use his celebrity... Because everybody, if you're going to go to prison, you got to figure out, what's my strategy? How am I going to get through this? And so he's going to try to use this celebrity, get in with the toughest inmates. Hey, guys, I was on that 70s show. <laughs> the guy would be like, oh, cool, man. I used to watch that. I wouldn't have recognized you. We probably never would have talked. Thanks for letting us know. I can't <laughs> believe I'm going to fuck Stevie from that 70s show. <laughs> hey, man, can you put that headband on first? Yeah. Oh, hey guys, I'm a star fucker. <laughs> Who would have guessed? <laughs> Are We're we heading to Florida? Let's go to Florida, baby. This guy, I remember. We've done this story. And now he has repeated the incident. <clears throat> oh, really? Yeah. Florida man busted trying to, quote, run across the Atlantic Ocean in a giant hamster wheel. Although this time it was amid a hurricane. Reza Bellucci, 44, was spotted late last month, about 70 miles off the coast of Tybee Island in Georgia. Tybee Island, I guess, in Georgia, as Hurricane Franklin caused life-threatening surf and rip, rip current conditions. Photos showed him in the middle of the quirky homemade contraption, or hydropod, as it's called, consisting of a metal drum with inflatable, inflatable buoys on each side, as well as paddles powered by him running inside the ball. Bellucci reportedly told his rescuers he planned to run more than 4,000 miles, that's all, to across the ocean to London. All right. Well, I hope he kept his cool when they told him he had to, you know, get out of his uh, little hamster wheel. He then repeatedly threatened to kill himself rather than end his wheelie risky run. He his claimed to have a 12 run. inch. He claimed to have a 12 inch knife and even a bomb sparking a three day standoff before he finally disembarked Friday in Miami Beach, Florida. He has previously been stopped making similar stunts in his hydropod in 2014, 2016, and 2021. Quote, I'll never give up my dream. They stopped me four or five times, but I never give up. Um, and I was thinking, shouldn't this be the ravings and the means of transportation for someone trying to get into America? <laughs> <laughs> that, that this is he's got it all backwards he's yeah, already in here right 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 well luckily when they when they stopped him they calmed him down by feeding him some gerbil pellets and they gave him <laughs> some wood chips to take a shit on he he asked if somebody could put put him in their shirt pocket and rub his neck a little bit 
hey, are you thirsty? We got, and they, they move in this, they crane in this big canister upside down with a little metal, little metal spout with a, with a ball bearing in it. <laughs> yes. Thank you. I'm thirsty. He gets to the prison and he immediately runs under a table. <laughs> you can't bring that vermin on board this Coast Guard vessel. Oh, man. All right, let's make let's go down to Florida. It was the guy was arrested. We're Australian in teacher, Australian teacher walks free after having sex with a student. Monique Ooms, O O M S, thirty one, was seen crying at the Court of Appeals in Melbourne after a panel upheld a ruling to only give her three hundred hours of community service after she pleaded guilty to four counts of sexually penetrating a minor under her care of supervision. Uh, the judge dismissed her plea uh, that she was mentally unfit to stand trial. Anyway, Ooms joined the high school last year. She began to message the 16-year-old boy. So boy surprised me after the penetrating comment uh, or whatever charge. Yeah. Um, so no, I think began- that having sex with him was fine. It's when she stuck her finger in his ass that she violated Australian law. And she did it on a Delta flight to Barcelona, and it right. did not go well. Yeah. Um, she began to message the 16-year-old boy after seeing that he was going through personal issues. The teacher then began sending pictures of herself in her underwear to the troubled boy. <laughs> That'll turn it around. Before the two eventually had sex for the first time in July of last year. The pair had sex several more times at her home and in her car before school officials were tipped off by an anonymous letter. The defense had testified. I love this part. The defense had testified in court that Ooms was depressed about her alleged infertility when she had sex with the boy. And then she showed up pregnant at her sentencing this July. Hey, now. I think that is an amazing legal strategy for being mentally unfit. (laughs) You claim you're going crazy because you're infertile and you show up with a giant distended pregnant belly. I can't get pregnant. Ouch. I have shooting pains. Look, you can shoot them. Look at it. You can, you can see the shooting pains move all around my belly, but I cannot get pregnant. Three. So, so she's not going to jail, but they gave her 300 hours of, 300 hours of community service? Yeah. That's, it's like a, you get a fucking pension after that. She, <laughs> and, and meanwhile, she only had sex with the guy four times. He's 16. It probably lasted three minutes each time. That's a, that's a total of 12 minutes of sex. And she's got to yeah. serve 300 hours? It's like a multiple life sentence relative to what went on here. Yeah. I mean, barely had sex. If this was Florida, the entire lacrosse team would have had to fuck her for for months. <laughs> All right. Um, All right, let's do some sports, baby. Let's do it. <clears throat> J E T S. Monday night. Where are you watching the game Monday night? Uh in my house on the couch. Uh I'll tell you why later. All right, fine. So that's all I'd say about that. I am I am a bandwagon Jets fan. I've been a Jets fan since I was three or something when my dad un- sadly took me to Shea Stadium to see uh, Joe Namath. My whole neighborhood were Giants fans. I should be a Giants fan, but uh, I'm not. It's been a, a curse, and I'm proud. I am proud to say I fully gave up on them about 10 years ago, and uh, and now I'm back. Unless they start losing, then I'm out again. Sorry, they've tortured me too much. Have they All had right. a good player since Joe Namath? Yeah, they put together some good. I remember they put together, it was like 2007 or 8, something like that. No, no, maybe even maybe even a little later than that. But I'm forgetting the year. They made it. I think they made it to the playoffs once. That's it? Uh, or advan- or won a playoff game. Maybe it's they won a playoff game. I, I mean, it's dead. illogical because they have the budget of the biggest city in the country. They oh. they are loaded. The Yankees are always number one. Oh, Rangers and- won the Stanley Cup. 
and any player going there is going to enter the world's largest marketing culture. In other right. words, if you do well on the Jets, just the ads that you'll do, the local ads you'll do in New York will make you rich. Right. Uh, Jets, I'm going to Google Jets one playoff game and see what comes up here. Anyway, talk about the John McEnroe while I Google this. Okay, so McEnroe begs U.S. Open to do something as players battle stifling heat. It's not humane. Uh, the four-time U.S. Open champion, who is working as an analyst for ESPN, uh, said during the Medvedev and Rublev match, they were drenched in sweat in the 93-degree heat. And he said, I'm sorry, please, USTA, in the future, I think seriously, we should close the roof. These guys are sweating more than Mike Tyson at a spelling bee. <laughs> These guys are sweating more than R. Kelly at the Teen Choice Awards. These guys are sweating like your mom at a paternity test. Look, <laughs> These guys are sweating more than a seeing eye dog at a Korean barbecue. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, I think the rest of the country is hearing 93 degrees and planning on moving there to cool off. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> wait, 93 during the day? <laughs> let's wait here. Let's check. Let's check my temperature again. You ready? Let's see what it is now. Let's see if we. We got up to 106. Oh, ho, ho. 106. there you go. Damn. 106 as I sit here I'm in gonna check, Austin. I'm going to check the weather in New York right now. New York right, the Jets eight, have won. Go 81 ahead. and raining in New York. Ah, all right. Oh, the quarterfinals are today. Well, I guess. Yeah, don't tell me anything. Don't tell me who's in the roof I, is going to be closed. Uh, right. No, semis. The semis. Both the semis are today, uh, Friday. Uh, in their 60 season history, the Jets have won 408 and they've lost 500 regular season and they had eight ties. They have made 14 postseason appearances and have an overall postseason record of 12 wins and 13 losses. So the Jets have won seven times in the playoffs between 1998 and 2023. So I popped out of my uh, abandonment of them for all of those times. I can tell you that for sure. Um, the Detroit Lions haven't won a postseason game since 1991. Well, they beat the number one team in the league last night or Thursday night. Yeah, so we've joined Kansas these. Uh, I'm going to do the uh, survivor pool, and I'm never betting for or against the Jets. But I'm, uh, I'm, No, that's I'm, my number one rule in my pool. You got I bet this in a from pool me. every year. Last year, I won it. I split it with two other people. There's like 200 people in the pool. And uh, my strategy is never bet for or against any New York team because they are fickle. They'll beat teams they shouldn't, and they'll lose to teams that they should have beat. Exactly. So I leave them alone. Right. Um, that's what I'm going to do. And uh, we also have other rules, which have which are popular, I guess, like only betting on home teams. Bet on the home teams. Stuff like that. I try to bet on – my strategy is I look at the worst three teams in the league and I try to bet against them when they're on the road. And that way I save all my top ten teams for the second half of the season. Don't give away your secrets here, but mm -hmm. I'm listening. All right, so you – you sent me this document when I was on the plane ride down here. And the first story that was in here, really the only before we filled out all the other stories, was an international story. So you're like, did you get it, the document? So I open it. I'm, I was upgraded to Comfort Plus on Delta. Uh -huh. I'm happy to report no one shit. But when they upgraded me, I found myself in a middle seat, which I never, ever, ever book. Oh. And so... In the middle seat, I open the document, and there, bolded in all caps, is the word whores. <laughs> and I am, no, no, this is exaggeration. I'm sitting between two women, and the woman to my right, I could feel she read it. I didn't dare look, I mean, she's two inches away from me. I could feel she read it. You should have written, are sitting next to me on the airplane. <laughs> <laughs> How's the whore on your right? You should have started because it's a Google Doc. Whatever you type in is live. And meanwhile, this is what was going on. To get the Google Doc, I obviously have to have Wi-Fi. I'm on my laptop at the seat. 
So the laptop is gigantic and I'm cursing it like, come on, come on, come on. And the top of the Google Doc says, trying to find a connection. And as soon as it found a connection, horse. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go to international. Here we go. A legal brothel in Wells, Nevada, has announced that customers with an ID from neighboring Utah will enjoy a 10% discount on all sensual services provided by its workers. Quote, Utah is our nation's most sexually repressed state, said Madam Bella Cummins. Do you think (laughs) she calls herself Madam like if she goes to, like, you know, Bennigan's or IHOP? and and Can I get a name for your reservation? Yeah, I'm Madam Bella Cummins. And Cummins? Is that her yeah. real name? Oh, I'm sure. Biological. Bur- at birth. On the certificate. So she's owned and operated Bella's Hacienda Ranch for the past 37 years. It's an hour from Utah State Line. And this year, Utah implemented a law requiring age ver- verification for all porn sites in the name of creating reasonable safeguards for our children. How about this? How about you put a law require uh, an age requirement where you don't show it to guys over 50 because it's too sad at this point. I don't want to see porn anymore. I've seen it all. If I haven't seen enough to get me across the finish line at this point, then something's terribly wrong. I think they may lose money on some of these. The guy, the guy at Utah comes over and uh, listen, my wife and I are swingers. So we'd like to get one of your gals and here are my eight wives and we are each going to get 10% off of this. So we get 80% off, right? Is that how it works? 80% off? (laughs) I went to the, uh, the bunny ranch, which is the whorehouse in uh, Nevada that Dennis Hoff used to own. Hoff used to love you. Hoff loved me. And so he used to come to my shows when I was in, in Reno and he goes, uh, hey, do you want to come out to the ranch? And I go, well, I'm married. And he goes, no, 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 just come out and take a tour. I want you to check it out. So I call Aaron and I said, can I go to the bunny ranch with Dennis Hoff? And she said, absolutely not. <laughs> and I said, well, what if I bring Kathleen Roll, who is the feature act? What if I bring her with me? And she goes, yeah, yeah, whatever. Just go. Weird strategy. Your wife says no. And you're like, all right, how about this? Can I go with a woman? <laughs> <laughs> who's actually really hot. And so I he picks us up. He sends a limo for us, and we go to the ranch, and he gives us a tour. And I, I don't know why he wanted me to see it, because it's the saddest place in the world. It's a bunch of, like, you know, trailer oh, homes. Oh, I've seen it. I mean, they had a TV show. Yeah, it's a bunch of trailer homes. And you walk in, and there's a bunch of women that it's hot. It is bad air conditioning. And, and you walk in, and I meet all the girls, and then they give me a tour, and like one, each room has a theme. Like one room has a, uh, it's an S and M room, and there's like a a fucking uh, hammock hanging from the ceiling that you put the person in. And another room has a hot tub. Which, if you get in a hot tub in a trailer at a whorehouse, <laughs> and you survive, you're a strong human being. I'd rather be on that Delta flight to Barcelona. Yeah, and less so, disease. So I see everything, and then Dennis pulls me aside, and he goes, uh, he goes, uh, hey man. You can have any of the girls. It's on the house. And I go, well, I've never been with a whore before, and it wasn't a financial thing. I wasn't, I wasn't waiting for a discount. Good point. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, let's get to some science and technology. All right. A woman suffered crippling pain after a medical device the size of a dinner plate was left (laughs) inside her abdomen for 18 months. That's like my kids leaving a plate in the sink. About 18 (laughs) months. uh, After she gave birth via cesarean. The unnamed woman. Why why is it called cesarean, by the way? What does Caesar have to do with cutting a baby out of your stomach? Yeah, I don't know. I know uh, Caligula... Uh, famously would tie up your penis, force you to drink tons of water, whatever, and then and then cut up op- and then give you a cesarean and, and yeah. all the, everything would spill out. So the woman in her 20s went through the procedures because of uh, whatever. 
Um, <laughs> she complained of severe chronic pain for months after the birth, and they discovered that an Alexis wound retractor, a soft tubular device used to draw back the edges of a wound during surgery, had been left inside of her. Weird. Alexa, yeah. Alexa, get out of me. <laughs> but what a backfire. It's like, all right, I want this procedure to remove my elevated maternal body mass was the phrase. And what do they do? They open her up and they throw a dinner plate in there. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what she signed up for. No, but I guess it would be kind of handy if you're the kind of person that likes to lay in bed and eat while you're watching TV. And you could just, you know, put the food right on your stomach, on the yeah, plate. Yeah, you want to lean it? Yeah, like yeah. Sh- I, we we should have uh, surgically like put like little can holders, little <laughs> co- koozies in our stomach. <laughs> it's not enough that they're in the lazy boy arm of the chair. Right, right. I want to have a I want to have a tissue box built into my <laughs> chest. That's perfect. <laughs> okay, dude, I I looked this up and it's it's not a good scene. Roman law under Caesar decreed that all women who were so fated by childbirth must be cut open, hence cesarean. Other possible origins include the verb seder, meaning to cut, and the term saisones that was applied to infants born by postpartum operations. What? Damn. So every woman in Rome had to have their babies cut out of their stomachs? Well, now it's saying, despite what pop history tells us, cesarean sections were not named after the emperor Julius Caesar, who was reportedly born via a C-section. The term cesarean is uh, derived from the Latin word cesis, meaning to cut. Oh, that makes more sense. Makes way more sense. Um, How is that other one so well written like it? And how it's lived forever, that other explanation. Anyway. Um, I thought maybe right. it was like a Caesar, named after a Caesar salad, because you take a couple of tongs and you get in there and you, and you dig deep from the sides and pull yeah. it up. Or it's while right before or after you're tossing that salad. Oh, hey now. What? Let's do a little This Day in History. You got it. September 10th, 1897, a 25-year-old London taxi driver named George Smith becomes the first person ever arrested for drunk driving after (laughs) slamming his cab into a building. He pled guilty and was fined 25 shillings. Uh, In the U.S., the first laws against operating a motor vehicle while under the influence went into effect in 1910 in New York. Uh, in 1936, Dr. Rolla Harger, a, a professor of biochemistry and toxicology, patented the Drunkometer, a balloon-like device into which people would breathe to determine whether they were inebriated. Wow. Um, so that was it. That was 36. the first. That was the first breathalyzer. What um, would they like? Light it on fire and see if it exploded. Uh, it would gauge the proportion of alcohol vapors in the exhaled breath width, which reflected the level of alcohol in the blood. Despite the invention, the breathalyzer, and other developments, it was not until the late 70s or early 80s that public awareness about the dangers of drinking and driving increased and lawmakers and police began getting tougher. I mean, I can remember, I mean, Jesus Christ, my parents drove, they would go out to eat and drink. Everybody did, all adults went out and they'd had three, four, five drinks, 10 drinks, and they all drove home. It was not a big deal. I once got pulled over. I had been drinking, and the cop said, just drive directly home. Yes. So for our younger listeners, this is pretty mind-blowing. I, as I said earlier, went to boarding school. There were no cars whatsoever. and uh, But we managed. It was the poor guy so weird thinking back he was he was a year older so it's i've always viewed him as older meanwhile the guy never lived to 19 but it was on spring break and he died in a drunk driving accident and that was the first one in berkshire that like the boarding school that we kind of knew of and when i remember saying that people were like you your high school doesn't have a kid who died in a drunk driving accident every year it was every year 
in so many high schools in the 80s, kids died of drunk driving. It was oh, yeah. baked into the equation. Yep. It happened everywhere. My One of my best friends, Tommy Bucci, this was actually after high. This would have been during college, actually just after college, but it was still at the time where people did it. And he was driving drunk, and he got on a highway going the wrong direction and had a head-on collision and died, and two people in the other car died. Jesus. It was and fucking devastating. He was Hackley had it. I remember. I mean, Hackley had it uh, where that was in Tarrytown, and that's where our sisters went to school. And uh, and I know someone it happened actually in college, in college, in, in college. It didn't happen as much because I don't think as many students in a weird way. I don't think as many students are driving in college as in high school. But uh, I lost a friend in college in, in Chicago in Wake uh not wait is it wake forest no uh chicago what's yeah what's lake the forest ri- lake forest exactly sorry so anyway yeah wow it's you know th- i mean this this article is right it was out of control yeah and then mothers against drunk driving is the first one to make a dent in it yep no pun intended yeah exactly oh well, the cars were crazy i mean in some ways they were safer, but obviously in so many other ways they weren't. They didn't have the crash technology and yeah. the glass and all of that stuff. Um, so, But your parents were driving around drunk in a big boat. That seems like a threat to buildings, bikers, pedestrians, oh, my everything. Dad, my dad once drove drunk into a tree, and uh, he was in the hospital for a couple weeks. Oh. And uh, they, we would drive past that tree almost every day. And it had all the fuck. It was like crushed in on the side. All the bark was missing. And it was like this tragic, you know, traumatic reminder every time we drove past it. That's how your dad carved his initials on that bastard. (laughs) (laughs) And that's all, folks. Speaking of death, Jimmy Buffett. We just Uh. missed him last week. He, uh, he actually died right after we started taping last week, so it was yeah. a while ago, but we should, we'd should we be remiss in not talking about the great singer-songwriter, Margaritaville, Cheeseburger in Paradise. He died in Sag Harbor. That's a good place to die in Long Island. Sure is. He had carcinoma. He was 76. Uh, and uh, Wait, how old? 76. I thought yeah, he would have wow, been older okay. than that. Yeah. Uh, he... Um, Dropped out of college and uh, was a shipyard welder. He was busking. He was a busker in New Orleans and then moved to Nashville to be a country musician. Yep. His uh, first record was a big flop, and then uh, it seemed like it was all over, and then he moved to Key West, Florida to live a beach life and focus on literature. But he kept recording music in Key West, and his new lifestyle began to take center stage. His records had more success. And no, no major breakthroughs until 1977. Margaritaville from his seventh album, Imagine Changes in that. Latitude. Uh, the record was a big hit, going number two. It also changed his career. Uh, he, he, his lifestyle of the the island lifestyle, lounge, lounging in in the sun with cocktails. Uh, he also had Son of a Son of a Sailor and Fins. Um, and his followers became known as parrot heads. They wore yep. Hawaiian shirts and came to his shows, and he opened up Margaritaville restaurant chains, a record label, casino partnerships, a retirement community, and eventually was worth over a billion dollars. Yep. Wow. Well, by all accounts, I mean, you see how many musicians, serious musicians, have put up he, by all accounts, was like the nicest guy from what I've heard. Well, it sounds like he never lost. I mean, there's something about struggling for a while that when you get the success, you you guard it and you appreciate it. And it doesn't go to your head as much because you know how it, 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 you, you get the sense that it's it's a little bit of luck and you yeah. and you got and you had lightning strike. And yeah, and, and you've also seen probably a lot of really talented friends and contemporaries not make it. You know? Right, yeah. Um, but, you know, he's incredibly easy to make fun of. Don't don't get me wrong. 
and that music and especially the parrot heads. But, you know, come Monday and changes in attitudes, changes in latitudes, you know, he has he has some good songs. No doubt about it has some great songs as well. Son of a son of a sailor. So, you know, I just like you imagine what do you think they're doing in that condo community? I think it's called Margaritaville. How how the fuck are they dealing with his death right now? Flags are at half mast, black armbands on the Hawaiian shirts. <laughs> I mean, wh- wh- they must be so sad. All Margaritaville's just up to doubles. Everyone is doubling yeah. the rum in that thing. Yep. Dark rum, dark day rum. Everybody's blowing out their flip flops. <laughs> God, if there's one place I don't want to go in my life, it's Margaritaville. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's let's cheer up. That was sad. Okay. Time for some funnies. You got it. So here's a weird one. Maybe you can make sense of this. All but right. the king and the queen are standing in front of the castle. Hagger yes. and his boys are running away with all the treasure. They're laughing. Ha ha ha. And the king goes, I didn't appreciate what I had until Hagger took it away. Yeah. And then the queen yells out to Hagger. Take me away. You don't get that. She's choosing to be raped by bandits rather than stay with her husband. It's that simple. Exactly. Wow. She feels underappreciated. And what would make her feel more appreciated would be a Viking gang rape. Wow. Yeah. This is in the Sunday paper. It's women. It's women. And it's somehow kids that are reading the Sunday paper are reading Hagger and seeing that. Women want to be raped. It's yeah. crazy. Meanwhile, she's like, take me away, Hagger. But he's clearly already taken her dignity away. Yeah. And any self-respect. Yeah. Yeah. And now she's uh, now she's smitten. Uh, speaking of smitten, the Lockhorns are sitting on the marriage counselor couch. And Loretta says, as she points at Leroy, who's scowling, Leroy has grown during our marriage, at least three pant sizes. Oh, so she's doing shot. fucking one liners at the marriage cheap counselor's shot. office. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, here's one that her, her, here's a, <laughs> she hits him hard with this one. She opens up his uh, paycheck and he's just undoing his tie. He just got home from work. He's exhausted. Not even a minute home. She goes, are they paying you a salary or giving you an allowance? <laughs> I think if he ever hit her, I think the listen, the, the viewers would understand. Oh, yeah. I mean, we're going from Hagger to that. Are you kidding me? Yeah. Uh, okay. To, to cool myself off, I don't think I've done this one. It's a far side. And in this 106, let's see if it's gone to 107. I'm going to check right now. It's a far side with uh, Santa at the typewriter and still 106. And uh, he's at a typewriter. And he's typing away, and the headline of what he's typing is Nine Ways to Serve Venison. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, How how many reindeer? And there's nine reindeer, right? I believe so, right? Dancer and Prancer. And I wonder if I cut off, and that's from 1981. Oh, you know why? Oh, the date is up above. It's December 26th. That's uh, weird. It's up above. I, I only look for captions below. So, that, yeah, that's what he's doing. That's amazing. The backups are in the pipeline. Uh, I like it. Yeah. Um, so here's, here's fucking Dagwood laying on the couch, face <laughs> towards the cushion. And, and Blondie comes in, and she's put together. She's got on like a, an olive green short skirt just above the knee, matching shoes. A black velvet blouse, sleeveless, hair is done to the nines, and this fucking guy not taking any of it in. Honey, are you gonna spend the Labor Day just lying on the couch? And he goes, I sure am. Just like that. I sure <laughs> am. It's not a discussion. He's yeah. he's not picking up on the cues that she'd like to engage. He goes, I'd spend my whole afternoon sitting in my office chair, so I'm enjoying this minute of the couch before Tuesday gets here. Here's what you do, Blondie. He's got his back to you. Pack your bags and get the fuck out. Like <laughs> yeah. that queen 
in Hagger the Horrible. Take, take anybody. Hitchhike. Anybody's going to pick you up. Get in a windowless van. Anything is better than watching your beauty fade as this fucking donut-wearing zero ignores you. Exactly. A disgrace God. to Labor Day. A disgrace. Ah. Oh. Um. Well, listen, you guys have hung hung in with us once again. Uh, we apologize about the first few minutes not being recorded on my end. Hopefully you hung in with that. I think the old audio, the backup audio, the as they say, uh, will be shout fine. Out, shout out to Adam Egget in Austin. To Absolutely. Give him my love when you see him tonight. Um, and don't forget to support our sponsors that support the show. You're going to go to Game Time and put in papers for $20 off your first purchase. And you're also going to go to prizepicks.com slash papers and use code papers to get a first deposit match up to $100. Win 25 to 1. Do it. Thanks to Midcoast Media, Beth and Key and John. And uh, sadly, Chris Denman was busy. He's got some music festival he's producing this weekend, but we missed him. Hold on one sec. Curtis? Curtis. Yes. God damn it. Curtis is the nicest fucking guy. And I always, spe- I've got this block. I've had a block for his name for the last 10 years. I don't know why. He treats me like gold when I go there. He's such a good dude. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give a free, I'm going to blurt it out right now, his name. And I want Key to leave it here and leave this part of what I'm talking about now. And now you'll hear when I blurted it out early in the show, that was an edit. I didn't really blurt it out. Curtis Nelson. Actually, you okay. should be like, I go, Curtis Nelson. Now you should be like, oh, yeah. Oh, right? yeah, of course. Of course. Curtis. <laughs> there we go. So that just jam that in in the top somewhere. Okay, good. Uh, All right. Because he, he, he deserves credit up top. He does. All right. Uh, thanks I, a lot It's for 106. Listening. I'm going to take it each. I'm going to take it each. Take it each, people. Entertainment, science, sports They know what we like, of course Obituary, funny, too Greg and Mike give us the news